But good morning. Welcome to Epiphany Parish. I'm glad to see you here for this online worship service. Two announcements for you. First of all, after this service, we have a class. It's online, Zoom class, part of a series. We're reading N.T. Wright's book, God in the Pandemic. Fabulous book, very short. If you haven't been part of this discussion, come on and join us today. You'll get caught up to speed real quick. Um, you can find out how to get there by checking the website or sending an email to Diane Carlisle or Ruth Ann Garcia, and they can invite you into that Zoom conversation. The second thing is we have our Have a Heart party, celebration, uh, February 21st, uh, where we gather together as a community. We raise a lot of money for all of the different organizations that we support throughout the world, in fact. And they are in desperate need this year more than ever before. Um, and so while usually we come on campus and we have a great big party and every corner of this sprawling campus is filled with people having a good time, but also through the charity of their donations, making significant impact for our friends around the world. This year we're doing it all on Zoom. So be on the lookout for what Epiphany's doing around the world. Be on the lookout for the Have a Heart celebration. And please, please be generous with your donations. Everything that comes in from that evening goes back out to the groups we support. Finally, I'll just repeat, I'm glad to see you. And please do keep in mind that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you have a place at Epiphany. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may worthily, perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known for us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they told him about her at once. 
Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out the demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning, Christians, speakers, and friends. I've been thinking a lot about simple stories and how important they are. And the ones that matter most to me are really the stories of my family that I carry with me. The things that we did together, movies, the experiences we had. But I've not always understood this. You see, I, like a lot of American folks, used to think, and if I'm being completely honest, still sometimes do, that the big stuff in life that really matters, well, it should come somehow in big, glitzy packages with neon lights blinking and circles and arrows pointing to it. And it's understandable. We live in a world that worships the big time, all the flashing lights. We love fame and fortune. We love ce celebrities and know more about, say, Jennifer Lopez's private life than we often know about many of our neighbors. And we raise up American idols one after another, but often don't know the incredible talents of our most beloved friends. It is as if we cannot see the big things in our own context, in our own midst. This last week, I, I started thinking about that. You might remember that Tuesday was Groundhog's Day, and the New York Times had an article about the movie of that name in which the main character keeps reliving the same day again and again and again. And this has become a real film classic. But the article mentioned that the film this year may feel a little too close to home. And isn't that true? Almost a year into the pandemic, I've heard a lot of folks express the feeling like we're living the same day over and over again. And while Puxatani Phil seeing his shadow might not have as much effect here in Seattle as it does on the East Coast, it got me to thinking of how everyday things that are close to home affect us differently and change our perspective when they happen in our own backyard. As I mentioned, here in Seattle, with the exception of things like last year's snowmageddon, Puxatawney Phil is just a cute little groundhog in a place without groundhogs and a climate mild enough for folks to loudly proclaim there is no bad weather, only the wrong clothing. But mention a marmot, which is a very close relation to the groundhog, to folks in the Yakima Valley, 
and it's a whole different story. Marmots aren't cute or cuddly to them. They are problem rodents who cause major damage to property and to fields, just as gophers do in Montana and groundhogs do in New York State and New Jersey. Jeremy and I found that out when we were living in the rectory in Middletown, New York. We had our little neighborhood groundhog living, I think, below our garage. And in our New York City ignorance, we thought that he was just the cutest little fellow. But talk about bringing out the fire and brimstone in a group of super nice and lovely Christian folks from church. Because groundhogs, it seems, had done a lot of damage to some of their homes. So they all came over immediately to check on what damage this groundhog might be doing. Luckily for him, he seemed rather happy in his little garage apartment and was staying away from the rectory's yard and foundation. So we city folk got to let him live safely there in his garage residence. In today's gospel story, we find Jesus beginning his earthly ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing. Jesus has called his first disciples and in verses 21 through 28 from last week, we read about his first public act of freeing a man held captive by a demon in the synagogue. In the synagogue, which was a public place for men, those who witnessed this were astounded by Jesus' miraculous act and that even the demons obeyed him. Back on, from the synagogue, Jesus and his disciples go into a house. It was a private place where women were in charge. The house belongs to Simon and Andrew, the brothers first called by Jesus to be disciples. As they enter the home, Jesus is told that Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. We read, so he went to her, he took her hand, and he helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. In years past, I've heard an awful lot of mother-in-law jokes told in relation to this passage. And I've also heard a lot of jokes about how isn't it just like a typical man to heal a woman only to have her serve him later. But this year, I can't help but hear this story in a different way. In years past, we may have heard about the fever and thought to ourselves, oh, I'll just take a couple of Tylenol and get on with it. The old buck up little buckaroo thing. But now, having a fever means we need to stay home. They're not allowed to go out because it is a potential symptom of COVID-19, which 26.6 million Americans have already caught. That is almost double the amount of folks living in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City combined. So in light of our current situation, the story really does hit closer to home. A fever now, much like in Jesus' time, is no joke. And so Jesus' healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law is no joke either. Like many stories in Mark, this one is a symbolic story that is reflecting the experience of the early believing community. So in Mark's healing stories, we have to realize that details matter, who it is, where it is, what is the ailment and the symptoms. Here it matters that the setting is a private home of Simon and Andrew, and that the person who is ill is the ranking woman of this house. We can joke all we want to about mothers-in-law, but the first person that Jesus heals from illness in the whole gospel is a woman sick in her own bed. 
We are told Jesus takes her by the hand, a practical action to help her up, yes. And then we are told he lifts her up. Or as it is often translated elsewhere, he raises her up. If this phrase reminds us of Jesus' ministry of resurrection, that is not a coincidence. This private healing is a big-time miracle that takes place in a private home. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law, then, is the first resurrection story in the gospel. Just as the demon did in the previous scene, the fever leaves her. And then, having been raised up and restored to health, she serves them. Now, on the most literal level, this may mean that she indeed gets up and prepares and serves food for them. She was in charge of the hospitality of the home. But the verb to serve is a key term in Mark's gospel. Its presence here shows that her service is to be interpreted as an example, a paradigmatic response of faith. Interestingly enough, the verb diakonian, meaning, to, meaning both to serve at the table and to do ministry, is used in Mark to refer only to the angels in the wilderness who serve Jesus in his time of temptation and the women who followed Jesus and served him. It is also used to describe Jesus' own ministry. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This term is never, however, used to describe his male disciples. So say what you will, Simon Peter's unnamed mother-in-law serves as the first example of the resurrection life and of what Christian ministry will come to mean. And it also shows us that Jesus is anything but a typical male. And this is a huge deal because as the church would continue to grow throughout the centuries, this story about women as close disciples and followers of Jesus, heads of churches, well, it was whitewashed because it shows right from the beginning that Jesus' ministry and his priorities were never, were never to be centered on those with societal powers and prestige and strength. He raised up all who needed his help and would receive it with faith. He raised up leaders from within the whole of the community and those pushed outside as well. Mark's gospel, thought by most scholars to be the first gospel written and a source for both Matthew and Luke, makes far fewer claims to fame, if you will, than the other gospels. In today's gospel, for example, after healing Simon's mother-in-law, we are told, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not per permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Even though Mark does use hyperbole here, certainly the whole of the town was not outside the door, we are told that Jesus cured many. In similar tales in Matthew and Luke, however, as the life of Jesus has become more distanced from the, that present time, we hear that all were healed because, well, that's how our stories work. As our context changes, uh, we need to change our stories to present and preserve the message. So the fact that this story of Jesus' first healing of a woman still remains throughout this passage of time tells us a lot about its veracity because it was a countercultural story and it had been subjected again and again to redaction and change. 
Had it not been widely accepted as true in the years immediately following Jesus' earthly death, this story would not remain. Yet, while this woman's name has been lost, her story has not. Jesus works miracles. Yes, but Jesus was not like other miracle workers of his time who made their living doing miraculous deeds for the big crowds that would gather around. Jesus started his truly, truly big time ministry, doing his miracles in a small private space. So what are we to take away from this simple story, this lectionary year B 2021? Well, I'd first suggest that Jesus is inviting us to look for homespun experiences of resurrection and miracles in our everyday life, in our own lives, in the lives of our family, and in our community. Miracles do happen in our own backyard. And while they may seem more green or bigger or grander in the grass over there, if we take the time to look at our own lives, there's an awful lot happening in ours, too. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law and the miracle of the COVID-19 vaccines would not have come to pass if human beings hadn't done the work of feeding, serving, and caring for others. What Jesus is showing us in today's gospel is that to be restored to health means that we can once again take up our communal responsibilities to others, just as Simon Peter's mother-in-law did. Caring for others and working on our relationships with our families and in our communities is an important dimension of our resurrected life, our resurrection life. In Mark's gospel, Healing, then, is not about an individual. Rather, it is about relationship. We all are raised up to bring the good news of the resurrection life to others. Now, the sad thing, of course, is that the resurrection life is not glamorous or uncomplicated. Mark's gospel is honest about the opposition to and the cost of proclaiming the good news. But proclaim it, we must. Not because it will gather us a following on social media or get us on American Idol, but because that is what Jesus calls us to do. The grass isn't greener over there. And each and every day, as mundane as it might seem, it is not only different, but it is a brand new opportunity to turn away from our old assumptions and our self-limiting beliefs, which might be keeping us from changing our world. The main character in Groundhog Day, Phil Connors, relieve, relives the same day over and over again, until he slows down and really begins to live into the possibilities of the day. There are some important truths in this old and seemingly simple movie, such as the importance of trying new things and concentrating on our own side of the street or argument or political divide if we want to change things. Or spending our energy finding out what we have been called to do. And perhaps most importantly, find out how God is asking you to serve others. Now I want to tell you, Pacific Northwesterners, this 2021, I really want to believe that there is no such thing as bad weather.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the God of compassion, who heals the broken and binds up their wounds. For the church throughout the world and for all who proclaim the message of God's healing love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the world and for all who promote human dignity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who struggle to establish greater peace upon earth, especially those who serve in the military, those on missions of hope and mercy, and their families, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those burdened by anguish or illness, and for those who care for them with love and healing, especially Bill, Melitha, Ida, Sam, Evan, Carrie, Susan, Trish, Olga, Marge, Addie, and for those suffering from COVID-19, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who rest in the hope of the resurrection, especially Donna Smith, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those on our hearts, offering praise and thanksgiving, intercession and solace, comfort and healing, for those we now name silently or aloud. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Put their trust in you. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in the thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen.
Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you've caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim 
the glory of your name. sin and become subject to evil and death. You and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and the Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is from the dead. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Join me in lifting your bread and your wine. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. My Jesus, you Thank you. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your life may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.